I want to welcome you to our December Sci Cafe, um, the Apalachicola mm -hmm. National Estuary Research Reserve hosts a monthly Sci Cafe, uh, the fourth month, month, the fourth Thursday of the month from three to four, and uh, about the science that's going on in and around Apalachicola Bay. Um, hoping to bring together both scientists, residents, and interested parties to, to learn from each other. Um, today we have Matt Klondolf, and he's um, he's going to be talking about uh, the restoring uh, connectivity in the Apalachicola uh, floodplain. And he is a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, and um, He's going to tell us all about a project he's been working on. So, uh, Matt, take it away. Great. <clears throat> Thanks so much. Um, appreciate the invitation to to speak. And um, I'm just to start off, I'm a big fan of the Apalachicola River and the whole landscape um, in in the region. My grandmother taught school in Tallahassee for many years. Uh, I'm blanking on the name of the school, but it's it's out near the airport. Anyway, uh, uh, as a kid, we would go to her, um, you know, like fourth or fifth grade class, and when and we were like a couple years younger, and you know, it was anyway, it was very exciting, uh, and we spent a lot of time uh, on the rivers and uh, the beaches in the area. And uh, anyway, when I had a chance, uh, it was about 15 years ago, to work with American Rivers. On the Apalachicola, of course, I was thrilled, and and um, the project, uh, the uh, the work on the Apalachicola has evolved over time. And we'll talk about the, our our work that we're doing now with the Riverkeeper and uh, a really great team of of scientists that uh, working together, uh, and this is focusing on trying to restore some lateral connectivity uh, to the river system, which I'll describe how that's been lost. So uh, Georgia Ackerman, the Apalachicola Riverkeeper, is uh, overseeing our project here. Um, the team includes a uh, number of people from um, Matt Deitch and um, AJ Sharma's lab in the uh, University of Florida, Milton. Um, Scott Walls also um, based in California. Um, I'll let you look at the, the various uh, people there, but um, Dan Tonsmeyer, the former, uh, Riverkeeper is uh, very much involved in the project as a construction manager and uh, all around uh, insightful uh, person. Uh, Ken Jones, our amazing project manager, and uh, we're supported by Mike Gangloff, um, Andrew Gannon, uh, both uh, biologists bringing in uh, some great insights, and Melissa Samet from the uh, National Wildlife Foundation, who's been um, guiding much of this for, for years. So you all are quite familiar with the uh, Apalachicola River Basin. I wasn't sure you know, how much background to give here, but I think it's carrying coals to Newcastle for, for this audience. Uh, but just to uh, put a little geomorphic context, uh, we're focusing uh, more on the lower non-tidal reach. Um, so around where the Chipola River comes into the Apalachicola and then downstream from there. Um, we have three sites, pilot project sites, for our attempt to reconnect the river with sloughs. And um, I'll talk about those. Let me first mention the East River, and I won't uh, talk much further about the East River sample. Uh, this is actually connecting to a distributary, which the East River is, but uh, thanks to a deposition of dredge spoils at the inlet to the East River, it's been largely cut off over time. Uh, and uh, our project there is to see how we can uh, improve the flow through the East River, which uh, we hope will have benefits in bringing more fresh water into this eastern part of the East Bay. Um, and then uh, I'll focus mostly on uh, Douglas Slough and Spider Slough when we uh, when we talk, especially Spider Slough, which is a, a place of exceptional importance, I think, in terms of how the processes work. So in, in many ways, the Apalachicola is a classic meandering floodplain river. Uh, it has very well 
well-developed meander patterns. But when you look at it today, uh, there's something a little weird. Uh, these sandbars have been enlarged as a relic from navigational dredging and disposal of uh, dredge spoils on the on on the sandbars. Uh, and this is a big effect from the uh, last half of the 20th century, which I'll describe a bit more later. The river is flanked by natural levees, which are are high areas adjacent to the channel, usually composed of sand. As the river would overflow onto the floodplain, it would first deposit sand, and then the elevations actually drop off as you get away from the river and become lower into what we would call the back swamp. And um, it's these areas, these low-lying areas away from the river, saloons, and just generally low-lying swamps, back swamp, where you have the uh, the swamp trees, the classic swamp trees, tuple of cypress. And uh, um, we'll, and these are. I'll just mention that um, the these are maintained by having uh, inundation in the late spring and early summer. Uh, and we'll look at what some of the impacts have been from alterations in the flow regime. The Apalachicola is a wonderful example of the uh, a very um, productive floodplain system. And uh, you know, there's lots of literature on this um, uh, sites in the tropics and uh, um, areas in. Uh, like the Flathead River in Montana, you know, the literature is full of examples of uh, well-connected uh, river systems, and those have been disconnected. But uh, uh, we have a great opportunity on the Apalachicola to enhance um, these interactions between floodplain water bodies, sloughs, and oxbow lakes, and the main channel. And of course, there's always connections through the shallow groundwater. Uh, but in many cases, restoring the surface water connection has a lot of uh, ecological benefits. When we think about river connectivity, usually in three dimensions, the longitudinal, lateral, and vertical. And here, the lateral connectivity between channel and floodplain and channel and slough is really critical. And that also is largely what controls the vertical connectivity, the high groundwater levels that uh, we like to see in floodplains and, and the areas adjacent to the river. When we look at the Apalachicola River system, if we look at the main stem only and think of the main stem only, we're really missing uh, most of the story. Um, there are many sloughs in the floodplain. So this gray area is the floodplain, but you see all these channels in addition to the, to the main stem. In fact, these connected sloughs uh, have a combined length of over 300 miles compared to 106 miles for the main stem. So it's really a very important part of the entire floodplain system. And looking at how some of these sloughs are configured on the landscape, uh, it's really, um, you know, if you're a local, you know your way around, uh, but uh, it can be quite confusing otherwise. Um, it's uh, certainly certainly not like the grid of a city street. It's very complex, and uh, you can even have a reversal of flow directions. Helen Light has worked a great deal on the Apalachicola River. I'm sure pretty much everybody on this call would, would uh, know Helen's work. She uh, came up with the term loop streams for many of these. These are streams that they, they uh, flow out of the main river. They follow some kind of circuitous path. They might join with other saloons and then they come back into the river. Uh, so they're not distributaries exactly. They they they're coming back. So uh, loop streams is a great term for them. Um, and uh, and the whole system can be quite complex. You know, as we look at it closely. And um, well, there may anything to, uh, to to say about the system. I want to talk about some of the key human impacts as a background to what we're trying to do and what little part we're trying to restore and improve. Um, first, the flows from upstream from the ACF basin have been reduced. And then Woodruff Dam itself has altered flow patterns in a, uh, a smaller way, but still important way. And a key thing is it's it's been trapping sediment. So we have uh, a reach of the river below Woodruff Dam that is sediment starved and has been 
in sizing or down cutting because of that. Farther downstream in the river, let's say from um, you know some around let's say Bristol and Blunstown, but especially downstream of there, very uh, intensive navigational dredging. Uh, the uh, this was for the Army Corps project, um, kind of a crazy pipe dream that they were going to make the Apalachicola a big navigational river and have uh, all this barge traffic. Uh, that was uh, dredging with, along with snag removal and cutting off meander bends. So all these things had a combined effect, which I'll mention in a moment. But um, one thing you don't see on this list of human impacts that you would see in almost any other river in North America is development of the floodplain. There's very little floodplain development on the Apalachicola floodplain. And that I, is just the thing that uh, is really remarkable. It uh, you have to um, give the state a lot of credit for for purchasing land, getting easements, uh, and and other partners, TNC and, uh, and federal agencies as well. Uh, but this is a really remarkable system. The potential is there for the Apalachicola, which is more than you can say for for most rivers in in North America. When you have to remove a lot of houses or or other things, that, that's a heavy lift to do restoration. Now, first, starting with changes in flow. Well, the overall amount of flow at a given year has not changed significantly. The low flows have declined. And we'll look at a particular pattern um, that has been ecologically important in terms of the, the, uh, the composition of the, of the forest. Um, this, uh, these are two plots, uh, hydrographs for water year 1941 and 2011 as a representative of the period before the big alterations and afterwards. And um, the big alterations are due to uh, increased use of, of water for agriculture with the onset of uh, center pivot irrigation, especially in the Flint River Basin. Um, so crops that were formerly rain fed, um, they began planting things that uh, required this irrigated uh, water. And then, um, and then of course, uh, more urban use, city of Atlanta and so on. Um, and then this is uh, further exacerbated by the patterns of storage in the core dams. So what we would see um, in, in uh, 1941 as an example is that as the you get the recession flow from the high winter flows, you would have a period of low flow typically in uh, uh, June, July, but by August the the flows would come back up. Uh, there would be some rains and and the flows would recover. Um, but what we're seeing today um, is that the flows are not recovering in many cases, or or not for a much longer time. Uh, and that's because so much water has been used upstream that when you do get rains in the late summer, that they're all soaked up and, and uh, or stored in the, in the reservoirs. So here you can see the, the longest period with no swamp inundation in 1941 was 78 days. Um, in 2011, it was 149. And by swamp inundation, I'm, I'm referring to um, water getting in, into these back swamps like this. Okay, so these periods of low flow have become longer. That has uh, significant ecological implications as, uh, as I'll talk about more later. Um, uh, John Tracy, part of our team, um, developed a, a plot here showing his uh, threshold for tuple seed, seedling survival. I think this was an assumption that they could handle 60 days of uh, of a desiccation, but not more. And this is basically um, <clears throat> showing the number of consecutive days in each year that uh, you had no flow in the swamps. And um, you can see that in, in recent years, since uh, basically since this increased demand in the basin, uh, that we've had a much longer periods without, um, without flow that would inundate these swamp areas. Another big impact was the failed navigation project. Dredging for navigation starting in the 50s really and 
going through the 1990s. Uh, this project saw very modest navigational and economic benefits, but huge environmental impacts. Uh, this was the, uh, the Army Corps Chief's letter to this uh, to, to Congress basically saying, yes, we should do this project. It was from 1939. Of course, things got delayed a bit. They were, they were diverted by a big war, uh, but by the late 50s, they were um, ready to go. Um, the, the dams were built or being built and they started dredging the channel. Now, the idea was to have a nine foot deep channel in the bed of the Apalachicola River a nine foot deep channel in loose sand. Now this would be a case in which they could have hired my seven year old as a consultant. And I think you know, we would have figured out that these, these uh, walls were gonna collapse, which is what, is what happened. And you had um, uh, instability uh, in the river system, which I'll um, talk about in a second. But I wanna emphasize that the impacts from this were concentrated in the period of the 1960s through, through the 90s. Um, basically, since about 2000, there hasn't been a dredging. And um, so these are impacts for which the rivers had some time to recover. And uh, when we think about the sustainability of the projects that we're um, um, starting now, I think that's a really important thing to come back to. What are some of the impacts of this navigation project? Well, um, dredging, as I mentioned, um, in the attempt to sustain a nine foot deep navigational channel. Uh, also, meander bends were cut off to um, straighten the river, um, uh, improve the flow for, uh, for navigational purposes. Uh, snags, there were a lot of snags in the river. Um, and if you look at this, this is number of obstructions removed per year. Um, so in this year, which was somewhere in the 60s, maybe 68, they removed something like 15,000 obstructions, which mostly would be logs. Um, so, so this was very intensely done during this period. Um, and uh, and this, these are the, the dredge quantities uh, for this period, again, up to about 2,000. So together, these resulted in channel incision in the lower non-tidal reach, also as reflected in this plot, uh, showing the, the uh, bed elevations in 2010 compared to 1960, so a 50-year period to 1960 in blue, the uh, 2010 elevations in, in uh, red or orange, whatever you want to call that color. Um, now, in addition to the lowered bed elevations, this channel instability caused bank erosion and channel widening. Um, the average channel width in the lower non-tidal reach increased from 390 feet in 1941 to 460 feet in 1999. Um, so that's, uh, uh, this, it's not doubling or anything like that, but it, it's a significant increase. And the result of the lower bed, the, the widened channel was that the river channel could could convey more water before it would it would uh, come up and overflow. So for the same flow, the river level was lower. And that had serious implications for inundating the floodplain and keeping the floodplain moist. Now that's for the for an effect for the same flow. Compound that by reduced flows from upstream, and and then you see uh, you know some impacts. Another uh, big kind of category of impact from the, from the dredging was the disposal of the dredge spoils. And um, this is a LIDAR image where you can see some of these unnatural looking features, which are old dredge spoil deposits. And of course, if you've spent any time on the river, you've no doubt seen the famous sand mountain. What you don't see when you're on the river, because it's uh, hidden by this forest is Site 39, which is sort of its 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 cousin, not quite as big, but pretty close. Um, and these are um, um, any, these are relics from this period of dredging, and all that dredging and all that sand that uh, the Corps had to dispose of somewhere. Well, not only were they disposing of sand like this on the floodplain or on the sandbars, um, but 
simply the the uh, activity of dredging was disturbing the bed and suspending sand into the water column. And so when you had high flows that would that would flow out onto the floodplain and through the sloughs of the floodplains, uh, there would be the sand in suspension, which would then settle out. And the result is that massive amounts of sand were carried into sloughs and deposited and and some of that sand is now blocking water circulation through the sloughs. An example would be this sand plug that you can see at the inlet of Spider Cut off of the Chipola River. So here's this uh, this island that is formed, and you can see from the from the uh, uh, bathymetry from the topo lines here that um, there it's a very shallow um, entrance very shallow and narrow because of all this deposition. So combine the effects of reduced flows from upstream, the channel change, which uh, results in lower water levels for the same flow, and then sand plugs cutting off the sloughs. So the result is for the sloughs, uh, they are being, many of them have been largely cut off, and this contributes to drying out of the floodplain. Then as the floodplain has dried out, we see that the number of swamp trees has decreased. This is really a, a, a striking change that has occurred. So going back to this uh, very informative diagram from Helen Light from a, a presentation in 2018, um, we see again um, this area, the back swamp, uh, the area that would naturally be supporting the swamps. And because the, the period of of the swamp being dry naturally was pretty limited uh, before the disturbance, before the change in hydrology and, and other things, um, that uh, this would be inundated for part of the summer. That would be favorable conditions for the uh, Tupelo cypress to reproduce, uh, but not for the other species like the low bottomland hardwoods. But now, we've gotten rid of that summer inundation. We just go from the low flow of the fall to the high flow of the winter and spring. And um, during the, the, the late summer, uh, we, or during the late spring and summer, uh, this is now exposed and dried out, which discourages Tupelo cypress from, uh, from reproducing. And it allows low bottomland hardwood species to invade. So we're seeing um, an increase in low bottomland hardwood in, in there and just a loss of the uh, tubular cypress. Uh, John Tracy on our team um, has been able to make some really uh, compelling maps showing this loss of, um, of, the, of the swamp trees. He's used the seasonality index approach um, pioneered by Cecilia et al. Uh, 2016. And it's based on the ratios of the NDVI values from winter when you have no leaves to summer when you do have leaves. Um, so those of you who are familiar with uh, working with remote sensing, you will know about NDVI values. For those of us who uh, don't use this frequently, it, it's basically a, um, a measure of reflectance and it has uh, you know, certain characteristics. And the key thing about this ratio, which I think is great, is by looking at both the, the, the summer and the winter values, it, it's possible to come up with this ratio and the ratios are distinctive for the different uh, uh, vegetation communities. Uh, for swamp hardwoods, in this case, the gray, um, the gray circles, or alluvial hardwoods, which would be low bottomland uh, hardwoods, or coniferous. So, um, John's been able to go back and, and the good, one good thing about this is uh, what you need to do this index, uh, you have even from some of the older Landsat imagery. So going back to the 1984 Landsat imagery, uh, he's able to um, uh, make this calculation and therefore classify the vegetation as being uh, Tupelo cypress, the, the, the purple or violet. Um, and 
tupelo cypress mixed with bottom line hardwood uh, which is in the green and then the gray is mixed bottom line hardwood so this would be the higher elevation uh, areas on the what we call the natural levee and some of these probably splay deposits and then um, and then you get into the the uh, the, the violet areas with uh, with the tupelo cypress with little patches of green little patches of low battle line hardwood which would be the higher areas that are in between some of these channels so that was the situation in 1984 and one great thing about this it, it agrees very, very well with the mapping that Helen Light did from that period. So, uh, so we have quite a bit of confidence in this method. Now, what gets scary is when we then do the same classification using the same bands on Landsat today. 2021, we see much of this has turned green, meaning it is now mixed with uh, low bottom land hardwood. Uh, and you also see an expansion of the low bottom line hardwood um, up here. Um, altogether, this has shown a replacement of Tupelo Cypress by low bottom line hardwood. Also a reduction in the total number of trees, a reduction in the total biomass. Um, so um, you know, we've created these places now that are are too dry for the swamp species. They, they don't work that well for Tupelo cypress anymore because of the ex extended period of, of desiccation. Um, and they're still a little too wet for bottomland hardwoods. The bottomland hardwoods are invading, but it's not their ideal habitat because of the uh, periodic flooding. Um, so it's a mixture, but, but we have lost actually in the number of trees. Put these two maps side by side just to bit easier to do the comparison between 1984 and 2021. Uh, it is, it's sobering. Now, um, I'll just point out that the, what, what's outlined here is the basin of um, logjam slough or the area in which the water that comes out by a logjam slough where that splits up. So what we see is that these, um, these sloughs tend to uh, bifurcate and, and they'll often join with, with other sloughs. So um, our question was, can we improve the flow through the sloughs that are now blocked by sand deposits? Um, so we were, um, this was consistent with some of the Northwest Florida Water Management District uh, objectives. And, um, and we, again, we focused on, um, on these sites Douglas Slough and Spider Cut, and I mentioned East River before, but I'll focus on these two uh, right now. And really the idea is to improve the lateral and longitudinal connectivity through the slough network um, by, uh, by our project. And what we have today is river waters flow from the, uh, well, they flow through the Douglas Slough from the Apalachicola to the Chipola, and then from the Chipola, they flow through Spider's Cut into the, uh, you could say the upper reaches of the Brothers River drainage. So this is all low floodplain, uh, but most of this water eventually will get picked up by the Brothers River and carried downstream. And in the course of it, it will be uh, bringing water to important stands of uh, Tupelo Cypress Forest. So how to uh, improve the connection of uh, these sloughs with the main river. Well, um, we originally were thinking primarily in terms of removing the sand deposits that were artificially in place there uh, because of the excess sand load during the dredging period. But um, uh, before we could actually get going on the project, Hurricane Michael came along and caused extensive tree blowdown of the sloughs. Uh, this was, uh, you know, not not what we had planned on, um, but it was clear that uh, some of this material had to be removed to improve the ability of, of water to flow through the sloughs. So for the Douglas Slough system, we had this tremendous blowdown throughout the system, um, tree fall from Hurricane Michael affecting the entire length of, of these sloughs. But in the case of Douglas Slough, um, the sand deposits were really severe only in the upper reaches. So 
Um, we adapted our approach here. We will be removing sand deposits here, assuming that uh, you know everything falls into place. Uh, these uh, essentially plugs that are that are stopping up the inflow, but then throughout the rest of the system, uh, we've been uh, selectively removing wood to uh, improve the ability of uh, of the sloughs to to drain and to flow. Looking at spider's cut now, um, spider's cut is really important for, um, well, here you see the area influenced by spider's cut, um, but really important for feeding the Brothers River. So it's kind of a continuous train of, of where the water would go from Chipola down through this part of the floodplain of spider's cut into the, into the Brothers River. And here I wanna just show um, in the earlier slide showing the change in vegetation, we had the outline of log jam slough here. And, and that's in, in orange. In red is spider's cut. Um, and then in blue is little spider's cut. And you can see they, they overlap. They're, they're uh, like these systems of you know, bifurcating systems um, with multiple distributaries, you could say, through here. Although, of course, all these things come back together. Um, so, so that's the area we're looking at. Uh, and again, um, it's very important for bringing water into this massive low-lying floodplain that then feeds the, the Brothers River. Now, what we find is an, in Spider's Cut, unlike Douglas Slough, which uh, had sand deposits concentrated mostly near the inlet, in Spider's Cut, um, we have sand deposits uh, throughout quite some distance downstream. Um, and here we're standing on a, a, a deposit that's about a mile into the, to, into the system. And this is the uh, deposit at the plug, uh, which you can see that the one thing you can see from this photograph is the way uh, willows have established on these deposits. And that's very typical. All these uh, artificial deposits um, from, the, from the dredging in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s uh, are are um, vegetated by by willow, and uh, that of course makes them more stable as they are. And, and now that'll, that'll be something that has to be uh, removed when we uh, when we clean out these plugs. Um, you know, let's see. Okay, all right. So there's that's right. I switched this to a PDF, so there's no time lapse imagery of this, but that's a view in the upper spider's cut, and um, this is a a site, uh, again, it's uh, uh, quite a ways in, um, we call it the racetrack, um, but when you're there at low flows, you see it's completely plugged with sand. And uh, we're, we're looking at um, at least several feet of sand deposited here, which we know from our, from our cores. But we could ask the question, where does all this sand come from? Um, good question indeed. Um, Matt Deitch's lab, uh, we've uh, collected and analyzed 23 sediment cores uh, from spiders, um, and all the cores were essentially pure sand. And this is very different from the composition of the natural, mostly finer grain floodplain sediments. The uniformity of the sand and the size class, mostly medium sand, um, it marks it as having come from the navigational dredging. So this is sand that was suspended into the water column by all this disturbance and, uh, and then carried by the currents into the floodplain and into the floodplain sloughs. Um, so again, the, the, the characteristics, uh, uh, it, it's quite clear where this stuff came from. This was an artifact of the navigational dredging. So to reconnect these sloughs, we want to remove some of these sand deposits to um, uh, you know, unplug the arteries, so to speak. And um, the, the, the plan is to use small suction dredges like this that will remove the sand. Then we move the sand to disposal sites either by barging or trucking or slurry pipeline. In the case of, of um, spiders cut, 
we have a, a actually an ideal disposal site in old sand pit owned by FWC here, and um, uh, we'll have a pipeline uh, that, uh, that pipes the slurry of sand uh, to the sand pit. So, uh, so that's in this case the most uh, uh, efficient alternative. But as if we were doing this in other sloughs, it, it might be different. The answer might be different. So um, questions arise, once you clear it out, will it just fill back in again? And I think the answer is no. It's been 20 years since the end of the dredging. We no longer have all this sand and suspension as was happening during the dredging era. Uh, bed elevations in the main river have stabilized or recovered in some cases. The channel's even begun to narrow. Um, as, meant, uh, as documented by the reduction in the area of open sandbar, as some of that has become revegetated uh, over the last uh, like, um, 10 years or so. And with less loose sand mobilized and transported in floods, there's now less sand in suspension and thus much less likely to have redeposition in sloughs. Uh, prior research has shown that as the river stage drops and these sloughs become disconnected, the water quality deteriorates rapidly. The DO levels go down, uh, it becomes uh, stagnant and uh, anoxic. Um, we have very nice uh, work done by uh, um, Philip Williams Associates or, or Environmental Science Associates and, uh, and Helen Light uh, from about 15 years ago. And um, <clears throat> we're doing baseline monitoring of water levels and water quality, as well as aquatic ecology now to, uh, to, to document this. So, the, um, so, we're, so we're doing the studies to provide the baseline against which we can measure change once the project's complete. So when we think about the prospects for recovery and restoration, the Apalachicola offers a unique opportunity. First, the extraordinary extent of its protected floodplain, with over 80% of the floodplain in conservation, either owned or in easement. Um, bottom land hardwood forests, uh, much of that is state owned. Of the swamp forest, the cypress tupelo, the majority of that is state owned. And um, as long as we can preserve that so that it can reproduce and, and, uh, and maintain itself, uh, here we have a really unique potential for ecological restoration through the restoration of channel processes. And again, uh, in the long run, we really need uh, restoration of flows from the upstream basin, um, probably stabilization of some of the dredge spoil deposits that are still actively erosing, and then opening up of the sloughs. As part of our study, we are looking ahead to evaluate some other sloughs in the system as possible candidates for reconnection with the river. Um, again, with uh, over 300 miles of sloughs, there are many potential candidates out, out there. Um, we're trying to use uh, these criteria for prioritizing the slough restoration, that the area of the slough, uh, the area that the slough would potentially wet, in other words, uh, you know, what is the area of influence of a slough in which it could help to restore the, the, uh, uh, the hydrology? And the cost benefit, you know, of course, the ideal project is uh, low cost intervention that would result in large areas being restored. Uh, areas where minimal dredging can occur at the head of the slough, thereby reintroducing flow, and where you don't have to dredge the entire slough. Uh, Douglas Slough being an, an example of that. Uh, we certainly did have to clear some of the debris from, from uh, most of the length, but, uh, but it doesn't require dredging throughout the entire length. Uh, the degree uh, of which, habit, uh, which habitat would be improved, uh, where we have some other water sources draining into the same area, and that's uh, something that has to be evaluated just on a site-by-site -site basis, uh, what the benefits uh, could be of that. And then the type of swamp areas that are affected. For example, um, mixed bottomland hardwood and tupelo or simply tupelo cypress. 
So places where we can bring more water to the Tupelo Cypress um, swamp area, that would be uh, the highest priority for us. And we are looking to be able to maintain flowing water at a lower river stage. And we recognize that uh, formerly there was a wide range of flows at which different sloughs along the river would connect to the river. And there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. There's nothing, nothing wrong with sloughs that naturally connected at a much higher uh, river flow. What we, we don't want to do is to take sloughs that formerly were connecting at uh, like higher discharges and then artificially trying to connect them at a lower discharge. The, the purpose is simply try to restore the threshold of inundation that was there before um, to try to re recover some of that uh, process that, that, that happened before all this disturbance. Um, now, of course, any kind of project like this um, were largely driven by opportunity or barriers. And so certainly access and land ownership issues are also important factors. And uh, there are some sites that uh, are very easy to access and, um, and, uh, and therefore you know, have a relatively high ranking, um, even though they might not affect as large an area, but we know we can do them relatively easily. So, so these are all being taken into account. And one of those practical matters is where can you dispose of the dredge sediments? So that's, uh, that's a, another big one. And again, it's a site by site kind of evaluation. Looking at some um, examples, the Shepherd Slough Kennedy Creek system brings water to the eastern side of the floodplain, quite distant from the river. And this is providing water to Tupelo Cypress Swamp Forest, um, as you can see here. So this would be a, a high priority, being able to restore some of the, some of the flows through that system. It's, it's a really impressive system. Um, you said here, I think this is Shepherd's, Shepherd Slough, the Shepherd Slough, um, Kennedy Creek, and you can see Shepherd is fed by um, sloughs that come off of the river Styx as well, well as off of the main stem. It's very complicated. <clears throat> Looking at the uh, types of forest that we have in the system, um, here the uh, blue color indicates Tupelo Cypress Forest. Um, dark green is low bottomland hardwoods and the the light greenish yellow that's uh, high bottom land hardwoods. So again, the, the we have <clears throat> Swift Slough and River Sticks uh, feeding into the Kennedy Creek system, and uh, and once the water gets down here, it's actually supporting uh, Tupelo Cypress. So in conclusion, we have now actually started some restoration on the Apalachicola. Uh, on the river and its sloughs itself. Um, now, thanks to the extent of the preserved floodplain, we do have an opportunity to restore some natural river process by reconnecting the slough network with the main stem, which we hope will yield benefits both to the swamp forest and potentially to the bay. Um, I haven't talked about that, but I, let me um, um, let me bring that up by by having flows inundate the floodplain. Uh, we know from research and other systems as well that this provides very important habitats, especially for juveniles, juvenile fish and other organisms. Uh, also very important for the Apalachicola is what's downstream, the Apalachicola Bay. And to the extent that floodwaters um, uh, inundate the sloughs and get up onto floodplains uh, to the extent that the whole system is laterally connected. As that water drains off later, it will be charged with nutrients, with organic matter, all of which flowing down into the bay will um, serve to support the, the food chain. So these are uh, really important considerations beyond simply the value of restoring the, the sloughs themselves. And um, our focus is really reconnecting some of these sloughs that used to connect with the main river at relatively low flows, the lower end of the flow spectrum. And, and it's that that we're, 
focused on trying to um, trying to restore. Well, I've given you a indication of some of the the monitoring, although I realized I left out a couple of key slides that I was going to put in there. But uh, but we have um, groundwater wells um, uh, in the transects uh, across Spider's Cut, for example. Uh, we have um, uh, detailed topographic surveys. We have um, water quality monitors out in a number of places. So, um, so we should be able to monitor pretty well and measure pretty well the effects of uh, reconnecting these sloughs. Um, but um, if, uh, if we go ahead and do the project and we discover that things are not working out as anticipated, uh, we're pro we're proposing this as an adaptive management approach. We'll we will we propose to uh, uh, recalibrate, um, modify the approach um, based on what we learn. This is um, th this is not sort of you know standard practice at this point. So uh, we have to treat it as experimental and take advantage of the opportunities to to learn and improve. So thanks for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Um, Alicia's looking to see if we have any questions. We have one from Jenna Harper. She said, great talk. I was able to go out with Georgia and Ken recently to see these sites. They indicated that they had received a lot of positive feedback from the locals about the SLU restoration projects, is that something that could be captured formally and used to support additional funding opportunities? Yeah, um, that's, uh, I think that is really important. In this case, um, the, the human ecology aligns with the, uh, um, with, the, the, with the river ecology and that restoring the circulation through these is uh, beneficial um, not just to the organisms but to, to the people who uh, you know would be catching these organisms and things like that. So for um, for fishing and uh, um, hunting and um, even just accessing things like beehives, having the, the sloughs more open is, is a real benefit. Um, that is a good question about how we're capturing that. That is a question I would let. Uh, Dan or or Georgia um, answer better, uh, but uh, but both of them have have done a lot of outreach with uh, with the community, and um, and actually we've been having meetings with uh, uh, community members who really know these areas, and uh, and that's been hugely helpful in understanding how the systems worked and wh where the uh, where the impacts are today. Uh, we've learned some things that didn't occur to us before about what features are blocking some of these systems. So, um, so I know it's, it's, it's been an important part of the project. Um, uh, it's not, uh, not my main area. So, uh, I would defer to others who know it better, but it's, yeah, a great idea. I think it's super important. Okay, and somebody has their hand raised. Chadwick Taylor, if you'd like to come off um, mute and ask a question, you're more than welcome to. Okay, I've not used this particular format before. Matt, we met on one of your first trips way back. I can't remember that far back, but I think both of us looked much younger way back then when Helen was doing her work. Um, yeah. There are not many ways that we can increase flows from upstream meaning Georgia and Alabama, uh, you know, changed operations of the core, and you know what that's like. But the Riverkeeper studied conjunctive flows for navigation and ecological benefits years ago. And now there's a move upstream to repair badly damaged locks and gates on the dams up the river. Uh, looks like that funding may actually get provided. And it's hard to imagine that uh, if all that happens, I know the interest upstream are going to want to talk about how to improve navigation on the river, which gets us to that 
question of uh, our study at Riverkeeper was for navigation without dredging. But you can imagine there are many interests and there's papers now and efforts now to look at some extent of, of dredging to improve flows for navigation and how that improves flows for ecological flows. My question to you would be, uh, given this is a wonderful presentation, what extent do you think, as we look at this pressure coming from above to you know, do some limited amount of dredging, uh, that we can look to maybe be able to do? I'm not saying that in an ad to advocate for that. I'm just saying I think it's going to come. How do you see that potential return of some limited amount uh, to the river, especially as it affects your st this study and all these things you've just discussed? Or is there any potential at all for that? Um, I really appreciate that question. And uh, yeah, it's, it's good, good to hear from you, Chad. Um, it has been a while. We were a bit younger at that time. Um, so here, here's my here's my reaction, and um, this is probably something that we should incorporate into a presentation or whatever. Um, <clears throat> first, I, I I want to come back to this idea that trying to dredge a nine foot deep channel in loose sand is is nuts um it was just wasn't from a practical point of view not very realistic um and i think they wound up with a shallower river a much harder river to navigate through because of the instability and they got regressive erosion um, from this this deep channel that they were cutting it would erode regressively towards the the margins and then the banks would collapse and the whole thing would widen and you wound up with this very wide very shallow um, channel shallower than it was before and i think if, um, if if that interaction were better understood it i think it's a real cautionary tale for this idea that you can go in and dredge and and, and have it come out the way you want i'm also reminded of um of a patent that a lawyer in illinois named abraham lincoln got uh in something like 1850 and it was a, a patent for a way that you would have um these sort of uh, air-filled pontoons on the side of a boat and when the boat came to a shoal in the river that these pontoons could be forced down and they would float the boat up higher. The boat would go over this part of the this, this shallow part of the river. And when it reached the deeper water again, you bring the pontoons up and the boat sinks back down. It's um, to me a brilliant example of, of modifying how you get around, uh, but respecting the geomorphology of the river. And I would, you know, it'd be fine with me to have some more boats on the river, um, including some bigger ones like that, uh, but that, uh, uh, they, that they would just be operating when, uh, when the flows are high enough to get over these shallow areas. That, that, that would be my reaction. As soon as we start digging into the river, uh, I think it's going to be counterproductive just from a point of view of, the, of, of geomorphic process and, and the likely response of the channel. Hope that is a useful answer. <laughs> it's a wonderful answer. Thank you. No, thanks for the question. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Um, well, thank you so much. It was a wonderful talk. We really appreciate uh, you uh, presenting your information. And uh, this webinar has been recorded and will be available on our Apalachicola website. Thank you. <laughs> and 
our next um, Sci Cafe is going to be on January 26th, and uh, Steve Lightman will be our speaker. So we hope you all will join us again. And Matt, thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Great to great to talk about the river. Look forward to talking to you again. All right. Thank you.